What is up, Packers fans, and welcome back to another episode of The Daily Draft, brought to you by the good folks over at Badger State Brewing, just minutes away from beautiful Lambeau Field in Green Bay, Wisconsin. I'm your host and the publisher of Packer Report, Ross Uglum, and today we are talking about one of the more popular picks for the Packers, which is offensive line. Um, a lot of Jordan Morgan talk, a lot of Graham Barton talk, a lot of Troy Fatanu talk. And so it's a it's it's a big time spot. Um, Green Bay, by the time you're hearing this very well, may have uh, released, you know, probable, uh, well, I would say locked in Packers Hall of Famer David Bakhtiari and honestly potential NFL Hall of Famer David Bakhtiari. He will more than likely be out the door. And while um, I'm very comfortable with his replacement, Rasheed Walker, some folks are not. I mean, that's a seventh round pick. Um, certainly didn't play flawless football last year. And the depth behind him, if they don't re-sign uh, Nyman or John Runyon Jr., I mean, it's a, it's a position of need. It's a place that I think that they'll go after bodies. Now, whether they go the uh, normal Packers route, which is like round four, round five, and round seven, and two out of the three end up being like pro bowl level players, or they get a little spicy and grab a couple top 100 offensive linemen, which is not something that they've done a ton. Uh, but it is certainly on the table. And joining me to talk offensive line it would be none other than my good friend Owen Reese. Owen, buddy, how are you? Good, man. How are you? Doing uh, spectacularly. And I'm excited for this one. Like, uh, and, and I can't remember what order we're dropping these in. We're kind of putting them in the can. So, like, I've had um, Trevor Sikama on. Great guy. Uh, but But not a Packers fan. Not, like, totally ingrained. Um, had a chance to talk to Eric Crocker about cornerbacks, like one of the smartest people you'll ever talk to about the cornerback position, not a Packers guy. So the ones that I get to do with guys like you guys, like justice, eventually guys like Jake stack, Jake Morley, um, they're, they're, they have a little bit different flavor to them because when I go through the Packers specific stuff, it's a conversation. It's not just me droning on and on. So, uh, super excited. Um, let's talk about the state of the room, right? Um, you know, I think, Green Bay, if the season started tomorrow, would have a pretty darn similar offensive line to the group that ended the year, right? You had uh, Walker at left tackle. Well, he'd be the left tackle. Uh, you got Elton at left guard, Myers at center. They're pretty entrenched, although Myers is, I think, working on an expiring contract and very differing opinions on his level of play. You had a rotation at right guard between Sean Runyon and Ooh, I, I, I combine their names <laughs> between Sean Ryan and John Runyon. A little bit of conversation about potentially John Ryan or John Runyon. Goodness gracious me, John Runyon returning. But if he doesn't, it's just a full time gig for Sean Ryan. And then um, our king, Zach Tom at right tackle. After that, it gets super dicey. Uh, the Packers have uh, spent some time with some kind of oddly shaped offensive lineman for them. Caleb Jones at 6'9", 370 or whatever he is. Uh, Luke Tenuta. Um, there are some, you know, projects going on in the building, but nothing that you would be really excited about if if some uh, offensive lineman started to drop. And, and I think that's something that needs to get addressed. And competition, certainly competition at right guard. Uh, there are some folks that would be more comfortable with some competition at left tackle. Uh, movable pieces too. Elton Jenkins can play right tackle, can play center, can play left guard. Zach Tom was a very good center at Wake Forest. Do you draft a tackle and move Zach Tom inside? Maybe kick Myers out to guard. Tons of conversations, but just your kind of feeling on the offensive line room as you see it. Yeah, I think the big thing, right, there's some some uncertainty about the future of David Bakhtiari. And um, even if you do feel good about Rasheed Walker taking over for him, I think Anytime you can add more competition and depth to the offensive line room, it's something you have to do. Um, and then as well as obviously, you know, talking about John Runyon, um, you know, he's a guy that I think you should continue to look to upgrade, even if you don't, um, even if he is retained, which I do think he's good and he provides value that way uh, as a rotational offensive lineman and um, can fill in multiple spots. You know, uh, But as far as that, I think it would be a fool's errand, I think, to just simply run it back with the same guys and just say, well, these guys have been, serviceable in the past um, we're going to continue to do that and then you mentioned guys like Caleb Jones and Luke Tenuta and Kadeem Telford are guys that they've had in um, and those are fine and I think those are guys you need to continue to try to work in and and really um, you know you're going to find guys every once in a while just by kind of recycling through I know that was part of the a little bit different but when Ron Wolf took over the roster 
right? I think they set the NFL record for transactions in a year, and the bottom five to six guys of the roster were just a continuing revolving door of guys until you find the guys that are really it. Um, and so I think you need to continue to do that. But um, I think anytime you can add competition to the room is good, and and obviously investing higher level of draft capital and, and assets uh, will be important for that. I, I agree too, and and I just ask you kind of where you stand on it. I mean, um, we we've had the the argument online, not you and I, but I mean just in general, and and, and there is certainly conversation about uh, the Packers and and the way that they do business. And I, I looked it up just because I was having kind of the conversation with somebody, and Brian Gutekunst took over in 2018. And and look, I look, I, I understand that um, you know he inherited truly a Hall of Famer, I mean, certainly a Packers. I keep calling him Hall of Famer, but certainly a Packers Hall of Famer at left tackle. So one of those spots uh, appeared to be locked down. He thought, I'm sure, when he signed Bakhtiari to that extension, that spot was going to be locked down, like long term, long term. Uh, but in his time, and and we've seen uh, what's he 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So we've seen six drafts. This will be his seventh. He has not taken a tackle to play tackle until round four. Um, he took Sean Ryan in the top. A uh, hundred as a college tackle, he was never going to play anything but guard for Green Bay. And then the the Elton Jenkins pick, but he was never designed, you know, kind of to play tackle. Um, it's just not been something that that Goody has done. Yet, lo and behold, you got a fourth round pick basically playing Pro Bowl level ball at right tackle, and a seventh round pick playing above league average ball at left. And and so, is this a draft, or does it bug you even not specific to this draft? that Goody's like, no, I'll just do it later. <laughs> and, and by the way, successfully, but he has not gone heavy after a tackle. Yeah. I think it's something too, where like, I, I, I wouldn't say it bugs me, um, but it's something to where, uh, you know, uh, again, we don't know the air, the order that this will be dropped. Um, you know, but you've had our, our friend uh, justice Mosqueda on the podcast and he's talked about, um, kind of like being pass rushers, being quarterbacks, right? Like when you want a legitimate one, you have to invest. And I think the Packers have kind of swung above their their range for quite a while. Obviously, Bakhtiari was a fourth round pick, and and you're kind of talking about they've been able to make chicken salad out of what they've had. Um, and and above what uh, above average, I don't want to say that Zach Tom and and Rasheed Walker and, and them aren't fine, but they haven't had a truly a big investment in the position in it in quite a while. Um, you know, probably I guess Jason Spriggs, right? And so. Whoops. Yeah, it would be nice. Um, it would be nice to see a legitimate, um, substantial investment in the position. Um, however, it, it's they're kind of in a between a rock and a hard place with Bakhtiari because just the the nature of how life goes. Right, the second you move on from him, now he'll be healthy, right, and then all of a sudden you're moving on from this guy, one of the best tackles that's ever played in Green Bay, um, and you don't want to run off other people, you know. But I think probably part of what's played into that a bit and uh, goes a bit with their cross-training method as far as how they play guys is they always have in the back of their mind, well, I guess we can always move out in the right tackle if we need, which obviously isn't ideal um, or isn't what you're looking for, but uh, you're able to get in and out of games that way or stretches of play that way. So they haven't had to kind of really say and, and invest, like these are our two legitimate bookends since they've had Bulaga and Bakhtiari. Um, so it would not hurt my feelings uh, as a obviously a college offensive line coach. I'm always – trying to add more talented big bodies to the room as you can. And um, I am a, a bit of a believer at the offensive line position, right? Like you should take value in your coaching and your ability to develop guys, but also like you're going to get what you pay for a little bit, right? And so can we get a, a starting level player potentially out of Rasheed Walker? Sure. Would I rather take a swing on someone like Graham Barton or Troy Fautanu? Absolutely. Like just give me give me a bit more marble to work with, um, you know, and and I'm willing to take a bigger swing on that. Um, but I think I understand why they truly haven't done it. Um, you've had we've had stretches of Bakhtiari, right? Obviously, some of these injuries are unforeseen, right? Like it's it's tough to forecast uh, an ACL and then a potentially botched ish ACL, right? Or, or coming back too early and then the, the turf issue and all that stuff. So um, I understand why they haven't done it uh, to an extent, but I I would be a big believer in. I wouldn't want to bank on Rasheed Walker continuing to play above league average as a seventh round second year guy. Right. So like he may end up starting in that suite or Yosh Nyman end up being kept around and that's cool. But like, I would feel a bit more um, able to sleep at night with a, a heavier investment at the position 
Um, and it doesn't have to be like he's going to end up being your left tackle for the next 10 years or anything, but I'm simply cool with adding a, a more high value spot as opposed to, again, kind of the classic shotgun method of the Packers. Like, let's throw a couple of bodies at this on day three and see what happens. Yeah. And I mean, I, like I say, it is a, it is a little bit hard to argue with um, just from their success level. And and the two that, you know, you talk about the, the shotgun approach and the, uh, the the successful runs and, and the, the two big ones to me um that stick out in my mind are 2022 and and we are sort of uh juries out on Sean Ryan but man uh you go Sean Ryan at 92 Zach Tom at 140 and Rashid Walker at at uh, 249 if Sean Ryan continues to progress and you just nabbed three starters <laughs> That's insane. And then the the all time crazy one that they that they pulled off was uh, taking um, Treader and, and Bakhtiari within 13 picks of each other. Treader basically ends up becoming a um, and then, by the way, they grabbed Nate, uh, excuse me, Lane Taylor. So they've got basically in UDFA, they, they got basically a league average to slightly below average starting guard in UDFA they got a hall of fame left tackle and they got like a pro bowl level center that got super paid after he finally left green bay so it, it is hard to argue with but I, I mean i do understand one other thing and, and like you and i i think we recorded a, a show just for packer report two years ago and we had a just like a brief discussion about daniel falele from uh from minnesota and i said i'm not gonna do it they're just not like they're not and and um, I've gone back and forth with people online and, and this is the, the offensive line, um, episode. So I want to address, I'm probably going to write it out more long form actually on Packer report, but, uh, I've done a lot of study just based on what they normally do and not to like prove I'm the smartest guy in the room, but just say, Hey guys, who should we actually be looking at? You know, who, who, what, what players do you want to familiar, familiarize yourself with that really have a good shot? of being green Bay Packers. What, what does a Packers offensive lineman actually look like? And, and that brought me to, um, to this here, which is every tackle that they have uh, drafted to play tackle in the first four rounds since Super Bowl 31. Why is that the cutoff? Well, because the, the, the table looks real neat and cute uh, like this, but um, yeah, again, people say, well, Ross, why do you care about 1996? Well, because Ron Wolf taught Ted Thompson who taught Brian Gutekunst. They haven't gone um, outside the tree. And, and the funny thing is, or I don't know if it's funny necessarily uh, some people, and, and, and sometimes I catch myself doing it, but some people will attribute this to the zone blocking system. Uh, no, you think they were running zone blocking when it was Amon Green up like Marco Rivera and Mike Wall? That that was not ZBS. That was not Alex Gibbs, Kyle Shanahan, nothing. Like th these these preferences predate even even you know running the LaFleur stuff. So um what am I saying? I'm saying that a tackle that's gonna play tackle for the Green Bay Packers, they're cool with short tackles. Like in general, they are cool with with short tackles. Uh, you look at Ross Verba, you look at Bakhtiari, um, Zach Tom, and certainly like, you know, Clifton and Bulaga and Sherrod were not, were not giants. Uh, but when I talk about what they won't do, and I've called them the super XL offensive lineman, Falele was six foot nine, 370, or whatever it was. And, and you're like, well, he'd be interesting. And I said, yeah, for Baltimore, which I think is even where he ended up going. Uh, but, you know, no, no lighter than 300, but no heavier than 321. No shorter than 6'4", but no taller than 6'6". Six, six. Like very kind of specific in what they do. And, and this is just sort of, like I said, my proof in the pudding that I kind of know what I'm talking about, or at least this has been um, what they've done. Do, do you not like the strategy? Do you understand why they do it? Does it, does it bug you? Um, what's kind of your thought on their historical love of kind of the same sort of body type, archetype type guy? No, I get it. It doesn't bother me. I mean, it, it's, I think that the Packers probably more so, I always bring this up and you brought up Baltimore and, and I, my admiration for them as a, an organization is not well hidden. Um, but I think the Packers are one of the few teams too in the league that have as much of an identity or known identity as, as 
a lot of a lot of teams do, and that's good, right? Like, I think you know, like we're on Twitter probably more than we should be, and the amount of fan bases that like don't have a great idea of what their front office is going for or how they're going to build a team is, you know, it, I mean, there's a lot of change and a lot of a lack of continuity around the NFL constantly, and I understand that, right? But but having an identity is good, right? Having a type is good. I think, right? As long as it's good, right? Like, you know, like people are like, oh, well, that's the fastest guy in the draft. That's a Raider. I'm like, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Not when it's like Jacoby Ford and Darius Hayward Bay, right? Like <laughs> Hayward Bay and Henry Ruggs and yeah, 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 yeah. Randy yeah. Moss, right? They yeah. trade for Randy Moss. I'm like, that makes a lot of sense, right? Like he's their type of guy. So, but the Packers, the way they've done things historically and, and obviously <clears throat> defensively, they'll start to, I think, look for a little bit different body types up front with the half lead signing, but like, they're going to like they, we know what we know what they're going to go for, right? And so those bigger jumbo sized guys typically tend to be a fairly volatile asset, right? They could yeah. be really, really good, or they're probably pretty bad, right? And so what the Packers have kind of been able to do with this site, like no, like we're not going to deal, right? It's the devil we know versus the devil we don't, and we know what we know, and we're going to live within that world. And you know, may may you miss on a guy like Orlando Brown miss. On a guy like Orlando Brown sometimes, sure. He's been a very good tackle in the NFL for, you know, and for a guy that was historically poor at the combine and whatever else, cool. You're also going to get guys like, I don't know, someone like, uh, not that he was a bad player, but someone like Jared Gaither, right? Or somebody like that was a a mountain of a human being, but like injuries are going to be a problem because it's hard to live. Yes. Much less be a world-class athlete at six foot nine and 360 pounds. And so like... They know what they know. They're very utilitarian. I've mentioned this before. The Packers cross-train their guys almost as much as anybody. It's tougher to cross-train a tackle to play guard when they're 6'8 and 375 pounds, right? It's just different. It's not wrong or right. It's just different. And so they allow themselves to kind of have that versatility and utilitarian um, utilitarian mindset of that, you know, Sean Ryan could play tackle. Sure. He could also play guard. It's also not out of the realm to play center, right? Yeah. David Bakhtiari, had he not been a, a all-pro tackle, Maybe he plays at guard, right? You don't know, like, and so they've kind of, and again, this is like a, a a player style comparison, not because he ended up any good, but the guys like Jake Fisher out of Oregon a couple of years ago, who were a tackle that ended up at center and jumbo tight end and wherever else, but like those kind of guys that are a bit more moldable maybe and aren't so archetyped and pigeonholed to, I can only play one spot, are the guys that they've tended to lend towards, right? Guys like Caleb Jones, who are currently on the roster, are not the norm. And notice, they deviated from that norm with an undrafted free agent guy. It's late. They're, yeah. they're, not, they're not allocating assets to something that they don't t- typically do. right? And we've even seen now some of the exceptions they've made outside of even the position. Amari Rogers was not a Packer guy. They made yeah. an exception. It didn't work. Right. And so I'm not saying that like you can only ever look within your spot, but what all of this overarching part to say is the Packers have a type and they stick to it because it's mostly proven to be successful. And so and that's, I, like, yeah. I don't, like I'm not, right. I'm not I'm mad they haven't I'm not mad they haven't deviated from it. I mean, are there guys that I've really, really liked that are different? Sure. But like at the end of the day, what they do works and I'm not I'm I'm a, I'm a, uh, as far away from a person as like don't fix what's not broken. Right. Like this has worked. Please continue to do it until it's proven to not work. Right. Like don't there's no reason to to reinvent the wheel if you don't have to. Yeah. And and I've gotten that in the past. Right. Where people are like, hey, idiot, Rashid Walker is heavier than what you're talking about. You know, and, and like their starting left tackle was three twenty four. Well, first of all, she was 313 at the combine. So he was right in what they do. But even if he wasn't, even if they thought he was going to be a 325 pound guy, they waited until round seven to take him. And we've seen that over and over again, where like a guy like Carl Brooks, I had him in the top 70. And this is not like, oh, Ross, you're so smart. That's not the point. I had him in the top 70. And that is based on my own thoughts, not necessarily like this guy is going to be a Packer. I would have told everybody Carl Brooks doesn't have a chance in hell of being a Packer. But they will go as round five approaches, and certainly as they get into round six, round seven, and undrafted free agency, they'll go, whatever, it's a football player. Like, we, we have what we want in the top 125, but then it's whatever. I mean, how do you think Ladarius Gunter running a 4-7 at corner ended up a Green Bay Packer? How do you, you know, 
like I said, Carl Brooks with his goofy body. How did he end up being a Packer? Well, it's round six, undrafted free agency. How did Caleb Jones at 6'9 and 370 become a Green Bay Packer? Undrafted free agency. That's when they're going to take a swing on, oh, hey, this might be interesting. Or like Kingsley and Igbari late in round five. He's just too good at football. We no longer care that he doesn't fit the athletic profile. Anyway, we're almost 20 minutes into the show. We've hardly talked about any of these prospects. Um, the last thing I will say before we actually do get into the prospects, though, is, I again, we don't 100% know kind of these um, order of operations, but Trevor Sikama, who's the uh, uh, lead draft analyst at PFF, phenomenal dude, said the exact same thing that you just said, which was, boy, it it almost freaks me out how knowledgeable Packers fans are online about what their team does in the draft. And, and I like to think that we're a big part of that, but like he said, you know, there's so many fan bases that just have no clue, which is fine. And he even talks about wanting to get more keyed in on what actual teams or what actual general managers like to do. But he was blown away at how well Packers fans understood the way that their team does business. And he was he was impressed by that. OK, um, let's talk about the stuff that uh, Owen hates, which is the uh, testing, <laughs> the, the numbers. Um, and, and we talk about Packer people and, and Green Bay kind of we've studied sort of what they like uh, over the years and, and um, it, it's really the same. And I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the cross training that they do their wants needs, whatever uh, for interior offensive line. Don't really change much for, for tackle. Uh, the only thing is once you start approaching that 325 pound mark, they, they, they generally will kick you inside. Like they've done with Sean Ryan, like they've done with a number of guys, you're just not going to play tackle at 330 for the Packers if they draft you at all, frankly. Um, so what do the Packers like? They like the relative athletic score. Again, we know Goody doesn't use relative athletic score, but they have a system that correlates closely, or I wouldn't be able to continue to pick out these guys. So generally, they will prefer to draft an offensive lineman, especially in the top 150, with a relative athletic score over seven. They like them to run the uh, short shuttle in less than 4.75. And they like them to run the three cone in less than 7.75. Uh, those are the big ones. So it's, it's it's an agility position for the Green Bay Packers when we're talking um, about actual testing numbers. And so who are some guys that um, that fit that? Well, Joe Alt, <laughs> good luck. <laughs> good, good, good luck with all of that. Um Tylen Grable was somebody, and, and and look, this is just in shorts and uh, a compression top, right? I, I had not watched a ton of Tylen Grable. I hadn't. He was not on my top 300 to begin with. He, so, like, hand up. I, I just He wasn't on my radar. And I know it's just how they look, but I, I am, A, the Packers like them, if you ever kind of sort of pay attention to what a Packers uh, offensive lineman looks like. But Dudes that are 320 that don't look like they're 320. Dudes that are not carrying the spare tire or, you know, the uh, when, they, when they're running, there's no stuff flopping up and down, which happens, by the way, guys, at the combine. Great. <laughs> yeah. Dude, Grable looks awesome. Yeah. And and, and tested super well. Um, Patrick Paul would hit everything. He's a little bit tall to be a Packers tackle. Patrick Paul from Houston. Um, Fuaga hits everything. I think he's a guard for the Packers, but he hit everything. One guy that is a super Packer in the sense that he also played in the Pac-12 is uh, Troy Fatanu's um, teammate, Roger Rosengarten. That dude screams mid-round Green Bay Packer. So those are some kind of uh, – and I think Sua Mataia actually from BYU uh, uh, hits what they normally look for in explosives, but we don't have agilities. And, and that's a whole conversation, why the NFL has basically scheduled – agilities out of the combine um but we just don't know enough about the three cone and the short shuttle for most of these guys to even get a grasp on who may or may not be athletic fits so let's not dwell on that i just kind of wanted to talk about the the what they do generally want so as guys run agilities at their pro day which is where they will run them then you can start sort of start to feel like okay is he taller than 6'4", but shorter than 6'7"? Is he heavier than 300, but not as heavy as 325? And, you know, are his short shuttle and three cone good? Okay, now I'm maybe looking at a Green Bay Packer. Okay, um, 
let's dive into favorite guys in this class. Um, I'll go, I'll go first if that's all right. Um, guys that I definitely like, and, and we are talking offensive line here, not just, uh, not just tackle. I know we've been kind of tackle heavy, but guys, that's the thing. Four of the five positions on the offensive line, Green Bay will take a tackle to play them at, <laughs> at the NFL level. So it's like you kind of take the center prospects and then you take the tackle prospects. You throw out all the guard prospects, sometimes sadly, and then you start to understand like who Green Bay might actually draft. So uh, guys that I am definitely higher on than consensus on the offensive line. I would say that I'm, I'm pretty heavy on Jackson Powers Johnson, the center out of Oregon, a real barrel chested type guy. Um, but just love the way that he goes to work elite, elite pass protector, but I think has enough nasty to run block. And, and certainly if I'm going to put a center in round one, which is where I have JPJ, like he's got to be a dude. I guess I don't know how much higher I am than him on consensus, but I know I like him quite a bit. Cooper Beebe for me is 34th overall short arms, short player. Don't care. Probably not going to be a green Bay Packer, but boy, does he move people in the run game. Uh, a year at left tackle, a year at right tackle, a year at left guard. Um, this is a dude that has a ton of college experience, and it was just really good. He's given up two sacks in the last three seasons, and I've got a highlight reel right now on my X profile of him just mowing guys down in the run game. Now, he's six foot three. He's got 31-inch arms. Probably not going to be a Green Bay Packer, but I think he's going to be a 10-year pro uh, starting at guard. A little bit further down the way as far as uh, uh, guys that I think I am probably higher on uh, than, than most, I, I would, I would guess. And, and again, I don't have necessarily like all the, um, all the uh, consensus stuff directly in front of me, Brandon Coleman at TCU, I think reeks of green Bay Packer. Um, I, I, I've got him at my number 100 guy. So technically he is a top 100 guy, but I mean, that's where he is for me. Play tackle, play guard, Super duper athlete, like crazy athlete, and would be excited for him to join the crew um, in Green Bay. And then a, a guy that you know, I mentioned, Rosengarten, the last guy that I'll talk about that I think just gets overwatched because everybody's looking at his teammate. I kind of like Blake Fisher from Notre Dame. I, he's a good player, um, and and I would be um, interested to see. You know, he, he kind of had a sort of a more mediocre relative athletic score, uh, ended up with a 7.72 real quick. This is great video. I'm going to see how many of the actual tests that he did just so we understand how complete and he did everything. So that's pretty locked in, um, missed what they like at the three cone by a hundredth of a second and cleared what they like with the short shuttle. She's he's sort of right on the, right on the edge, but man, um, six, five and three eighths, three ten, multiple year starter. That's a, that's a Packer. If you know, maybe he can shave just a touch off that three cone at Notre Dame's pro day. Any guys that you like in this class? Uh, yeah. Um, admittedly, and I'll, I'll say hand up here. Um, I'm, I coached division three during this football season. Uh, so I'm not as plugged in as I'd like to be on the national scope. Like I'd be lying to you if I said I watched a play of Roger Rosengarten. I have heard of him. Um, but <laughs> I like, have I just, heard of him. I have heard of him, but I don't. Right? So like there's there's certain blind spots I do have, uh, admittedly, to that. Um, but throw, so uh, through my time at the Shrine Bowl, um, I've, I've gotten to know some of these guys. And Tylen Grable was a guy who um, we had gotten recommendations from, from Coach Hand, uh, Herb Hand, the O-line coach at UCF. And obviously a bigger, taller guy, kind of built more like a power forward, as you mentioned, than a true offensive lineman, um, but moved well. Some of the guys I think that I probably have a bit more of a tendency for, um, Julian Pearl. I gave a really big, big grade to last year, ended up going back to school, um, came back out this year, um, played left tackle in Illinois. I think he's a really nice athlete. He is a mammoth person in in person. Um, uh, saw him at, at the Shrine Bowl. He's all of 6'6", 315". Um, built really well. Again, not a lot of soft uh, baggage on there. Uh, I like him quite a bit. Um, Garrett Greenfield from South Dakota State, I think is a guy that I think that um, should test well and should end up in Green Bay's ballpark somewhere in probably early day three uh, as a guy that maybe moves inside, but um, big, long developed player out of South Dakota State. Um, Donovan Jennings, the left tackle from South Florida is a guy I've also for a couple of years thought is a fits the Packers mold. Um, 
broke his leg last year against Louisville earlier in the year, ended up coming back, um, had a hell of a game against Alabama. You can go watch that um, against Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell if you have any level of competition concerns about him coming out. Uh, Ross, someone that you're familiar with, Jalen Sundell, uh, is a guy who's played tackle and center as far as looking at the Green Bay, um, kind of take out the guard prospects and look at the rest thing. Um, put a big grade on him this summer. I couldn't believe uh, that we ended up getting him. I figured he would be playing an all-star game down in Alabama this year, um, but had a good year, is a very good athlete, um, probably a, a slightly above average athlete as a tackle, a well above average athlete as a center. Um, he's yeah. a guy, he ended up, unfortunately got dinged up early in the week for us at the Shrine Bowl. So um, I'll have to see. Hopefully yeah, I'll he's be at any of these pro day because he did not run. So I'll be, yeah. I'll be there. Right. Pearl didn't run either. And I tell you what, I don't mean to interrupt, but again, didn't run, didn't do nothing. You talk about a Green Bay Packer. Let me talk to you about this. 6'6", six, six, flat, 312 with 35 and one ace inch arc. Big 10 left tackle. <laughs> Julian Pearl, Green Bay Packer. I mean, we'll we'll see how the testing goes, but I'm, I'm with you there. And should, by the way, yeah. oh, go just ahead. for your own knowledge, both Jackrabbits tested out of their minds. McCormick and Greenfield blew the thing up. Correct. Um, and then uh, just kind of speaking to, um, I guess, well, uh, Julian Pearl should test, I think, pretty well. I don't think he's going to be an elite tester, but should be fine, should put himself in Green Bay's ballpark. And then the last two guys I'll mention are two, um, obviously, John Runyon up in his ballpark. Carson Barnhart and Trent a. Jones were both uh, Swiss Army Knives from Michigan over the past two or three years, played multiple spots apiece, both played tackle at times for Michigan, so we can cross that threshold off. Um, and should, again, both be modest athletes, not poor athletes, but not top, top guys, um, but can kind of fit anywhere. If you told me that they drafted Carson Barnhart to play guard and Trent a. Jones to play center, sure, right? Like any of those things, they will fit about anywhere. Um, and so those are guys as well, I think, that uh, should fit. Also, I think we'd be remiss uh, as a, as a Wisconsin-based, Packer-based podcast if we don't mention Tanner Bordellini who tested outside of his mind um, at the Combine. I would not have saw that coming. Uh, They practiced at UWP the first week of uh, their fall camp this year. I saw Tanner play in person. Uh, I thought he moved well, but I would not have suggested that he would be a top 1% tester ever at the center position. Uh, But but important thing, even for like the anecdotal stuff, uh, played tackle at times during his career at Wisconsin earlier, just like Elton Jenkins did as a freshman, played tackle and then bumped to center the next three years and then um, ended up in Green Bay but had the tackle experience. So he would be another guy, I think, and again, who should fit physically in that 6'4-ish, 307, 10-ish pound area where he's not too big but he's not small. Um, I think the Packers, and and this goes back a little bit, you mentioned, right, they kind of have like – fit in these specific parameters, right? Not like they just cross the threshold, but also like not too, not too short, not too tall, not too heavy, not too light. I think a lot of that has to do with um, how the Packers have chosen to pass pro in the past as well. And they've stayed away from those size outliers um, for the most part, I think simply because the Packers asked their tackles to be on islands a lot in pass pro, not quite as much from what I saw later in the season with Jordan Love as they had in the past with 12, but they, need the guys to be able to move, right? And so when you have those big size guys like Falele or like Orlando Brown or or Bryant McKinney, those guys in the past, those huge, huge tackles, they're mostly just going to underset everything and make you run around, which is fine, but that's not how the Packers have technically, right? A lot of their bigger plays have been broken, extended plays, and it's much easier to give a quarterback a two-way go out of the pocket to escape that way when the tackles can play on an island as opposed to when you're just saying don't get beat inside and make them run around, right? So, and I think a lot of that goes to inside as well. Just better athletes, right? Simple ability to mirror and handle things one-on-one as opposed to trying to dictate the rush lanes of the D linemen. And so I think that these guys, right, like they're not the outliers, they're not the aliens, but that's for a reason, right? They all are fairly similar. um, And then they can move better that way as opposed to, again, like I said, trying to like, just don't get beat inside. Like, well, cool, but like it makes it tougher to escape when the DN is just auto containing because he knows he's not going to win inside. I want to talk. So, we've done, a, I think, a, a good job here of sort of uh, bringing some guys' names to light, right? Some guys where, you know, we're talking about what the Packers have actually done under Gutekunst. And again, 
good, bad, or indifferent, whatever. I, however your feeling is about that, um, these mid-round targets, your, your Zach Toms, your Sean Ryans, like these are the guys he's been actually acquiring. So we've, we've done that. We brought those guys' names to light a little bit. But I do want to get into the top guys. And I, you know, I, I kind of went on a long-winded uh, Twitter thing, as I sometimes uh, do, and you know, took out Alton Fashanu. Not going to happen. Just, just call it not going to happen, right? And then took all the guys from uh, 15 to 100 on the consensus board that, that played tackle, right? And then um, removed all the guys that don't fit removed uh, the the guys that are taller or shorter or heavier, you know, and, and that ended up, unfortunately, being a lot of guys. Uh, Fuaga, Latham, Mims, Guyton, Suamataia, Patrick. I think they would take, by the way, Suamataia and put him at guard. And I feel the same way about uh, Kieran Amegadze. I think the, the Yale kid, both of them. But uh, that really brings us to if you are in the camp, and many are, if you are in the camp that the Green Bay Packers are potentially going to use pick 25 or pick 41, on an offensive lineman, then there's four guys. <laughs> to me, there are there are four guys, um, and, and really three and a half because, I mean, Blake Fisher is consensus 96, and that's really not that far off from, like, where I have him. Uh, Blake Fisher's not viewed in the same light as these other three guys. So I, I want to get your thoughts on Troy Fatanu, sub six foot four, enormous arms, <laughs> like real, real long arms. And, uh, you know, I think a lot of people would, would consider him a guard, but I'm, I'm willing to see Graham Barton, tall guy, short arms. Again, a lot of people think he's, think he's a center, think he has to move inside at the next level. I've heard Green Bay likes him. You've heard Green Bay likes him. Uh, some, some discussion on, on Graham. And then the guy that I finally ended on and said, here's the guy, <laughs> here, here might be the guy. And that is Arizona left tackle, Jordan Morgan. Kind of your thoughts on those three guys. Yeah, so um, again, kind of hand up. I did, we did, for the Shrine Bowl, we did summer cross checks. So I did see Fautanu and Jordan Morgan, um, their junior tape. And had Jordan Morgan as my highest rated tackle coming into the year. Um, and he's a guy, like you said, just him and Brandon Coleman were both very high. And I agree. Both of them scream Green Bay Packer to me, I think. Um, Morgan has some injury history, if I remember correctly. Uh, so that's something to kind of monitor. Um, I have not seen – I've seen a lot of the Twitter clips. I know Fautanu is a stupid athlete, and the 6'3 thing does not uh, necessarily scare me away as much as as some. Um, obviously, the the average NFL tackle is not typically that short, but we have seen guys like Kelvin Beecham do it. Again, Kelvin Beecham, like, not a world beater, right? So, like, if those guys can survive there, I'm not saying it's ideal or prototypical, but – shouldn't just necessarily be a, um, well, you can't play this spot because. Um, so Fatanu, I know well, I've seen quite a bit of just through secondhand touring. Um, and again, I, I think that his movement ability uh, should, should allow him the ability to fail a tackle first. Um, I, I know the, the height thing or whatever. I, I just simply like, I've seen enough bad offensive tackles at any level of football that are just large. So like, that doesn't necessarily, that's not the uh, the killer to me if someone's half an inch shorter than what you'd like them to be. Um, so Fatanu would be a guy I'd be very generally interested in. And then uh, Graham Barton as well. I, someone I, I do the ACC for the Shrine Bowl, so I'm very familiar with Graham. I met him down last year at O-Line Masterminds. Um, obviously a Duke kid. He's going to be stupid smart. Um, but as far as he's a guy that played center as a true freshman in the COVID year um, and then has played left tackle for them the last few years, I, I've been very high on Graham Barton for about two and a half years now, so I'm probably a bit biased that way. But again, I'm not super – I'm not as willing to completely just write a dude off due to arm length. I understand the concerns, and I'm not – again, like ideally do I wish Graham Barton had 34-inch arms? Yeah, so does he probably. But like I – you know, it's one of those things where um, I've seen Graham Barton do extremely well in the ACC against Miles Murphy, against – um, Jared verse against guys like, and, and he's done fine. So like, am I going to sit here and plant my flag on the Hill that Graham Barton can never play anything other than the left tackle? No, but if he was a guy and if, so if with all that being said, if green Bay said, we're going to draft Graham Barton at 25 or 41, and we're going to let him start out at left tackle. If he beats out Rashid Walker, sweet. If he doesn't, he's going to be our top interior reserve at all three spots. And if Rashid and he both play so well that they eventually think about moving Zach Tom into center because they have 
three starting tackles, cool. You know what I mean? But, like, he's a guy I think that would be able to fit in fine at right guard, especially in that wide zone scheme, right? Like, he's not a – again, and that's kind of the Packers thing, right? Like, they don't have a bunch of, like, 340-pound guys that, well, we need to be able to displace this guy six yards off the line of scrimmage. It's not a thing, right? His ability to I have no questions about, right? I know he was hurt, didn't play at the senior bowl because of that, didn't test at the combine because of that. But I know, like, Graham Barton's an above average athlete as a tackle. So he should be a very good athlete inside. Yeah. So if that if that's the that's the fallback, I'm completely cool with that. Um, but honestly, all three of these guys, this conversation, I'm more familiar with Graham. But whether it's Jordan Morgan or Fontanu or Graham Barton, it's all a very similar conversation, which all kind of lends us back to this this flat circle of a discussion of Green Bay has their type and the guys that fit their type should fit their type. Um, so all that being said, admittedly, I've seen much more of Graham Barton than I have the other two. Um, but Jordan Morgan was my highest rated tackle in the country last year in cross checks. And I've seen a lot of the Fatanu stuff and I completely understand the hype. So this is very poor analysis on my part as a guest on your show, but it is a complete cop out of, I think I would probably take Barton just due to familiarity, nothing else. But I think that those three guys are like very clearly um, home run swings worth taking in the top 41 picks. And I think that those are, Kind of getting back to Trevor's point, like it's probably kind of annoying how good we're getting at kind of like maneuvering through the smoke and figuring out like, well, these are the guys that actually matter. Yeah, hundred percent. And the other thing too is like, hey, if if Barton is that good and Tom is that good and Sheet is that good, you just let Josh Myers' contract expire. And I don't care who plays center, whoever snaps the ball the best. Like I, it can be Barton, it can be Tom. It can't probably be Sheet, but it can be Barton or it can be Tom. Uh, no problem at all. One other name I do want to throw out there just because I friggin' love watching him play football, Zach Frazier, the center at West Virginia. Oh, my God, is he fun to watch? I don't know if he's going to be a Green Bay Packer, but uh, a ton of a ton of, uh, a ton ton of of fun to watch. Okay, uh, we're going we're gonna to button up the show here, and I've been answering this on the last couple that we have recorded, but that is not a requirement because you know what the heck is going on in Green Bay, and that is the gun to your head question. Um, the Packers are going to have seven picks in the first five rounds because of the Alan Lazard comp pick, the uh, Rasul Douglas trade where they lost one, gained one, and, of course, the trade of quarterback Aaron Rodgers from a season ago. And I think this is not that difficult of a gun to your head. Question, Owen, will the Packers take an offensive lineman with or before the Alan Lazard comp pick at the end of round five? I'd be more shocked if it wasn't two. Uh, yeah, <laughs> maybe. Because, I mean, like, I – so I, this is a bit off the rails. I was talking to Justice when I was at the combine. My, in my opinion, what I, my preference would be, and this probably isn't like the the cool thing. That, like I hope they trade down. I hope they end up with like four second round picks, and they can go and they can complete. Because I think that's where the strength of this draft is, dude. I'm with you. I no like, like I, later I, twenty five to to eighty. If I, the, like if if I could pick as many times as possible between twenty five and eighty, yeah. I would. I'm I'm a thousand percent with you because like that was i think that's where the strength of this class is and like i did uh i mean obviously our favorite mock draft simulators right like which is of course what's going to happen um but like if you told me that green bay could trade down in the second round and they could get like trade to like 35 and they can get graham barton uh tavandre sweat jonathan brooks I'd say Cam Kinchins, but he tested very poorly, but I still feel as though he's actually a good center fielder. Some mix of James Williams in there as your your box safety enforcer if we're gonna we're gonna go uh true Jeff Halfley and, and play some sticky man and heat the boys up single high. Um, you know, but any of that area, right? Jordan Morgan could be in there, Fatanu could be in there. Um, you know, the I think that's where the like the breadth of the class is. And instead of like in years past, we've had this issue where we had, like truly had to like, well, no, I think they should take one of these eight. Play- like I remember when Rashawn Gary went at twelve. Everyone had this like, I hope they take one of these thirteen players at twelve. I'm like, cool, you know what I mean? But like, it's very hard to, to do that. Yeah. But I think that if you can say like, if they can come away with two or three of these seven guys from the second to third round, like then then you're really cooking. And then I think you're getting more bang for your buck out of this class. Like, if you're not gonna like, unless if they unless they take twenty five and forty one and trade up to seventeen to Jared Verse or something like that, if unless you're going to go up and, and really take a home run swing, 
pull back. Obviously, that's the easiest thing to say of all time, and you need to have someone trying to trade up to trade back. But in my ideal world, come back and come get five starters out of this group as opposed to trading up and getting two starters out of the first three rounds. Obviously, easier said than done, but that's that's where I see it, Nat. And so, like, then if you go, you trade back, they take Jordan Morgan at 41, and they take – Tyler Newman. No, Tyler Bortolini in the fourth yep. or fifth round is is then then you have your former tackle who's also going to be an interior rot- rotational guy, and you have your tackle who may play guard but also may play tackle, and like that's where I think like ultimately we've talked about this ad nauseum here, but like the flexibility that the Packers give themselves by drafting guys that could or can play multiple spots has really been kind of the key to their. Right. Well, John Runyon was a left tackle. He's also played left and right guard and probably could also play center if needed. May have already played center. Right. Zach Tom played center. He played left tackle in college. He's also played right tackle for the Packers. Sean Ryan played left tackle in college. He's already played guard for the Packers. Like the the amount of like flexibility and cross training allows them to like truly optimize their 46 eligible guys every week. And that's the big thing, too, of like, well, Graham Barton might play guard. Who cares? He could also play tackle. He could also play center. Right. Like, and so instead of having to pigeonhole yourself into like, well, I need this spot at this draft slot. Otherwise we can't do it. Right. That's what allows their kind of their shotgun method to say, we're going to take three really good offensive linemen and let them figure it out and let Luke Buckus figure it out because it doesn't really matter. And as an offensive line coach, I hate that because of course it matters, but right. But like you allow yourself the, the ability to like have fallbacks as opposed to like, I took Daniel Falele in the first round and he didn't work. And now what? Now I have a, a quite literal waste of a large waste of space on my roster because, or like Lucas Niang with the Chiefs, right? Like, yeah. struggled, right? And I, I liked, I admittedly kind of liked him coming out, but I was like, you look at him now and he's struggled to tackle and he can't do anything else. And you're like, well, now what? Doesn't have the leverage to play inside, 100%. Yep. And, and so now you, the Packers don't take those 6 9 guys because they take a bunch of 6 5 guys and, Six five guys can play everywhere. You can't play a six nine center. So, all right, Owen. Thanks so much, man. This has been truly awesome. Uh, appreciate you very much, and uh, we'll catch you down the road. Absolutely, man. Appreciate you having me. All right. We hope you guys enjoyed watching the show. Uh, we hope that those of you that are listening on the podcast side enjoyed it as well. How can you help us out? Buy the Packer Report Draft Guide. Use promo code DAILY, as in the Daily Draft, D-A-I-L-Y, for 10% off of that bad boy. Check us out over at Packer Report. Uh, follow me. I'm at Ross Luggum on X. Follow Owen. He's at Reese Draft. That's R-I-E-S-E, Draft, uh, on X, Twitter, whatever you want to call it. Do everything that you are supposed to do here on the Packaday Podcast YouTube channel. Like, subscribe, click the bell, and get the notifications so that you can get every ounce of Packers coverage on a daily basis that you require and that you desire. Have an awesome rest of your day, folks. Go Pack Go!